Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Fritz Hen will present new approaches in treating depression. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $340 million and is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Fritz Hen. Dr. Hen is a professor at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. In 2014, Dr. Hen received the Colvin Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Mood Disorders Research and is a member of the Foundation's Scientific Council. The Scientific Council identifies the most promising research areas in order to fund uh, with Foundation grants. In his lab, Dr. Hen applies imaging, animal studies, and genetics to understand the basis of depression and schizophrenia. His group is attempting to use animals modeling depression to identify the genes altered by aversive experience, which may contribute to depression. They're also beginning clinical tests with patients using deep brain stimulation to inhibit a specific region of the brain as a potential treatment for depression. The successful move from studying animal models to working on patients suggests this modeling may help to identify the pathophysiology of depression. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Hen's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will present your questions to Dr. Hen, and he will address as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to present Dr. Fritz Hen. Fritz, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Bernstein. And we're going to talk today about new ideas for the design of effective antidepressants. And this, this are studies that come out of the animal modeling that we've done. And it should be noted that uh, NARSAD is actually one of the funders of the postdocs who've worked on this study. In the very first slide, uh, where we look at the remission rates of depression, you see why it's necessary to get better and new, uh, more effective treatments. Depression will go away on its own about a third of the time. And if you use effective psychotherapy, you might get up to half of the people well. If you use standard antidepressants, the kind that we talk about very frequently, the SSRIs, we might get up to 65% of people well. But that still leaves a large group that doesn't respond. Some of those people respond to either ECT or transcranial magnetic stimulation. But even there, we only get up to about 85% of response rates. That means that 15% of the people who have depression, which is one of the commonest illnesses that we have, uh, have no effective way of dealing with it. In the next slide, I want to start by looking at the kinds of treatments historically people have tried to develop. In the 50s, the idea of the monoamine hypothesis started, and the idea was that compounds such as serotonin, denoted in the bottom as 5-HT, and norepinephrine might be low in the brain, and that they weren't acting effectively. During the next 20 years, we learned that they actually act by interacting with cell surface receptors, going into the cell, changing gene readout, and 
enhancing uh, compounds such as neurotrophins, BDNF, that alter and make synapses, the connections between cells, more effective. So the idea was, if these are low, let's find drugs that will increase these. And that's what the serotonin reuptake inhibitors do, for instance. They stop these drugs from being sucked out of the synaptic cleft and allow them to interact with that synaptic receptor, post-synaptic uh, post receptor. There are other mechanisms that have been thought of over the years. One of them has to do simply with stress. Remember the HPA axis, the fight or flight response. If we are stressed, our body puts out a lot of cortisol, and cortisol can protect the body during stress, but too much cortisol can be really detrimental. And the idea was that this system was running over time and acting as if we were always stressed, and that maybe that played a role in depression. However, thus far, we haven't come up with any medications that are really effective in blunting that axis and treating depression. Over the years, other compounds have been thought about and tried, NPY, substance P, and the mu opiate. Mu opiates are very interesting because there actually is a very long history, going back to the 1930s in the German literature, which suggests that these actually might be effective. And buprenorphine, in some cases, today even, can be used in very treatment-resistant patients. However, because of the addictive potential, this is not an avenue that we really wanted to explore. If we go to the next slide, we see that major depression has a lifetime prevalence of about 16.5%, with a 12-month prevalence of a nearly 7%. And 2% of those people are classified as severe. Remembering the number of people who don't respond from the first slide, this gives us about a million people in the United States who are not responding to treatment at any given moment. And that's really catastrophic. We've got to do better. So going to the next slide, I'm going to try to get into the model that we've chosen. And we actually chose to start with a psychotherapy model that was developed by Ted Beck at the University of Pennsylvania years ago and is the basis for cognitive psychotherapy. And what he postulated was that there is an event, a normal event, that we misinterpret, we distort it, and we see it as a negative event. This makes us anxious and depressed, and that makes us act in ways that are not particularly helpful. In fact, they're maladaptive. And therefore, that creates another event that doesn't turn out well, and this cycle is repeated in a downward spiral and you end up in depression. The idea in cognitive psychotherapy is obviously to correct the cognitive distortions that take place. But this model had two students of Dr. Beck's, uh, Zeligman and Meyer, think about the possibility of an animal model of depression. And initially, they started with dogs. And what they did is they exposed dogs to a dog run that had an electrified grid. And if they put them in this run and they just turned on the electricity and, and the mild shock appeared, the dogs obviously jumped out of the run. If they put a lid on the run and did this in intermittent bursts and let the dogs back in the next day without the lid on, they found that some of the dogs didn't jump out. They called those animals learned helpless. That's the model we decided to assess in the next slide in rats. And what we did is you take a series of rats. The executive rat has a control and learns to stop the, uh, the shock. The yoked animal simply gets shock with no control. If you follow those animals in a second session, you find out that all of the executive animals are not helpless. They will escape any adverse stimuli. 
that there's a distribution of behavior in the yoked animals. Some of them aren't helpless at all, and some of them are very helpless. What we did, our contribution, was to decide that maybe we could genetically breed the helpless and the non-helpless. Now, Steve Mayer, who developed this, did some work, and the next slide shows his model of what happens in depression. And this was a very important paper about a decade ago, which suggested that the medial prefrontal cortex can sense whether we have control of a situation or not. And if it senses that we don't have control, it, it activates. That activation, Steve felt, activated an inhibitory neuron which stopped the secretion of serotonin or, in fact, dopamine or, in fact, norepinephrine. This same pattern was felt to apply. And so he thought this might be a circuit that underlies depression. We were interested in this circuit, and because we had these breeding lines of rats, which you see in the next slide, we got them up to the 100% helpless and 100% non-helpless, we wondered what would be the difference in the metabolism of the brain, the way the brain works, between these two lines of rats without any stimulus at all. And my lab gave these rats to a young graduate student at the time, this is about a decade ago, Jason Schumacher, and he looked just at energy metabolism. And what he found stunned us because there was a very strong difference in a structure that we'd never even heard about. In the next slide, you'll see these brain sections, and you see where the arrow is a very dark, round man. That's the lateral habenula. It's also magnified about six times over the rat brain size. And in the normal animal, that is not active at all. It's like the surrounding tissue. This was very, very surprising, and Jason joined me as a postdoc, and when we moved to the Brookhaven National Laboratory, we decided to look at this using PET scans and live animals, the helpless animals versus the not helpless animals. And Martine Marion, who was a NARSAD winner, did this work, and what she found looking at these animals was that there was a typical PET scan for a helpless animal, and there was a typical PET scan for a resilient animal. And you see that on that, on that next slide. If we combine these and look at the difference, we find the lateral habenula, that very bright yellow spot, is really activated. That's what's different between resilience and helplessness. And so we figured we'd better look at the connections of the habenula and try to understand what it was doing in the brain. In the next slide, we have the data from Hikosaka's lab, which came out almost at the time that Martine was doing these PET studies. Quite independently, he was looking at the habenula, a, a small structure that had been ignored in neuroscience up till now. And he conditioned monkeys into two groups, one of which got rewards and the other of which a signal suggested punishment was coming. And he found out that lateral habenula neurons, a portion of this structure, really were excited when the condition was you're going to get punished when something negative was coming up. So it looked as if the habenula could be signaling negative events. And if it were overactive, maybe this would really be uh, a way of going back to the, the Beck scheme and seeing everything in a very negative light. So we wondered what happened in our depressed animals. Could we reverse this overactivity and would it change the behavior? We postulated in the next slide that the lateral habenula actually sits in this circuit. And then we did 
some track tracing and showed that these excitatory glutamate neurons went from the habenula to GABA inter uh, neurons, which are inhibitory and would inhibit the secretion of serotonin or norepinephrine or dopamine. So it would inhibit all of these monoamines that we thought were important. And that happened if there was too much glut glutamatergic excitement. Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to it. So the idea was that this circuit may be a circuit that mediates depression, and if we could tone down the lateral habenula, maybe we could stop depression. We tried this after we did some track tracing, and the next slide shows the results of all the connections we found to the lateral habenula. We found that the hypothalamus, that circuit that uses cortisol when we get really stressed, has a direct input into the lateral habenula. We also found that a circuit from the hippocampus to the amygdala went into the habenula. The amygdala is the center which reacts to fear, and the hippocampus and amygdala circuit is central to this learned helplessness model. If you sever this connection between the hippocampus and the amygdala, the animals will not become helpless. So fear plays a role, and that goes directly into the habenula. The medial prefrontal cortex, as we've already talked about from Steve Meyer's work, that also had a direct input into the lateral habenula. And the lateral habenula, when we tracked, traced, had neurons that ended up going excitation to inhibitory GABA neurons to both the dopamine system and the um, uh, serotonin system and the norepinephrine system. So this looked as if it was really uh, much too active in depression. And the idea was, could we tone it down? Now at this point, I wondered why no one doing imaging, and a lot of imaging had been done by this point, it was now about 2010, why no one had found the habenula before, hadn't anyone seen it. So we did a literature search and we came up with an amazing paper. The next slide shows the results of that paper. It was done by a group at the Wellcome Trust the leader of the group was Dr. Dolan. Professor Dolan is one of the world's experts in PET. And this paper was never referenced. And what he showed was that the habenula got very active during a tryptophan challenge. And what I have to tell you now is what is a tryptophan challenge? Well, serotonin is made from tryptophan. And so if we postulate that depression at its last stage is because we have too little of these amines, too little serotonin, then if we can reduce serotonin in the brain, we ought to see depression get worse. And the tryptophan challenge was simply to take people who had already responded to a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. This means they were depressed patients who got better with a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. If those patients were given a mixture of amino acids that did not contain tryptophan, it turned out that the body in making proteins uses amino acids so rapidly that the serotonin in their bloodstreams went down very rapidly. And what Dolan found was as the serotonin went down, depression scores went up, and only one thing in the brain changed that he found. And that was that little yellow dot in the center of the slide, which is the habenula. That seemed very clear to me, and I wondered why it was never referenced. So I talked to several of the leading imagers in the world who had worked on depression, and all of them said that they ignored that paper because they thought the habenula was too small and it wouldn't really show up. It, it, it probably was an artifact. Now, I know Professor Dolan, and I thought he's one of the best pest researchers around, and I wondered whether this could be reproduced using another method. So Wayne Drevitz, 
who shared the Colvin Prize with me last year, uh, is a person who does a lot of very good imaging. And I went to Wayne and I said, can we use another method that has more sensitivity, something called arterial spin labeling, and redo this tryptophan experiment and see if, in fact, the habenula is the only structure that increases its activity. We did that, and that's exactly what we found. So if you go to the next slide, you now see that what we wanted to do was inhibit the habenula in these animals and see if that would make them better. And we decided to do that in the rat using deep brain stimulation. And in the top of that slide, you see the decrease in activity when we inhibit those cells with an electrode in the habenula. And if you put the electrode, if you look down at the box on the left-hand side, lateral habenula, you see that the, the red one, you see that the electrodes are right at the edge of the lateral habenula. If the electrodes are right there, you reverse the helpless behavior. The animals become better. If they go into the medial habenula or are out just about two millimeters away, you find that there's no effect on the behavior. So if you could get the electrodes in exactly the right place, it looked like you might be able to cure depression with deep brain stimulation in this target as opposed to the target uh, in area 2425 that Helen Mayberg has used. Now in the next slide, we have a case report where a student of mine in Germany, Alex Sartorius, had a patient who was in her late 50s and she had a 25-year history of depression and it would respond to ECT. But each time she got depressed, the periods that she stayed well got shorter and shorter. And finally, they were down to a matter of days. And you just can't keep giving a person ECT. It's going to impair memory. And so we were running out of ways to treat her. We offered her in, in the German hospital at Heidelberg at the Central Institute of Mental Health we offered her and her husband the option of this deep brain stimulation of the habenula, telling them that it was a totally untried procedure and uh, getting a national ethics committee to review it and an internal ethics committee to review it and her family to review it. And when she was well following ECT, we talked to her about it. All groups decided this was worth a try. And so we operated. Six weeks after we operated, she was still quite sick and didn't show much improvement. When we turned the stimulator up to the highest level, she suddenly showed much greater habenular inhibition and improved. At six months, she was totally well. And just as an aside, I went over to Germany and met her husband and her. And he told me, this was about two years after the operation, that we had returned his wife to the woman she was before she ever got ill. Three times during the intervening, it's now been four years, the stimulator has gone off. And three times she has gotten totally psychotically depressed within 24 hours. And when the stimulator is turned on, she gets better. Now, we've started a study at Mount Sinai using DDS in this target. And we've had modest success, but we've also had a failure. So there's still a lot to learn about this. And we're not sure that this is a way of really treating uh, depression I think it's a way of learning something about the circuits and perhaps the subtypes of depression that respond. But what we'd really like to do is we'd really like to find a way to get better medications. And so in order to get an idea of what was going on in the habenula, look at the next slide. And you will see that we are trying to figure out what type of cell is so overactive. The red cell you see 
labeled is one of the cells whose recording you see below, and it's m way overactive compared to a normal animal. This is in our learned helpless rat, and this cell is firing away like crazy, and we think that's part of the cause of depression. If we use a label that marks glutamatergic neurons, and it's labeled EAAC1, and we overlay these two images, we find that the overactive cell is a glutamatergic cell. And that gave us the idea that the glutamatergic system is where we should really focus. Now, while we were doing this, other workers had been looking at ketamine. Ketamine is an anesthetic drug that can cause psychosis, but used at the right dose in some people, it will reverse treatment resistant depression. And that is interesting because ketamine is an antagonist of the NMDA receptor. That is, it blocks a glutamatergic receptor. So we thought that if there's this great excess of glutamate, it may cause toxicity, and we know that glutamate can do this in the brain. And if there's toxicity, you may destroy synapses, the nerve endings that talk to each other. If we go to the next slide, PSD95, that's a marker of synapses. And looking at that quantitatively in conjunction with a group at the University of California at Irvine, we wanted to see, would we be able to show that in the learned helpless rats, there were fewer synapses? If you look at the next slide, you'll see that that's very clearly what we found. And in several areas of the cortex, there are just simply fewer synapses. So it looks like there's a toxicity. And that toxicity may be because there's too much glutamate. So one way of approaching the treatment of depression might be to find a way to get that glutamate out of the system. Now the next slide is a glutamatergic synapse. And this is an animated slide. And it's actually a slide I borrowed from Carl, Carlos Cerati. And he made it because of ketamine. Remember I told you that ketamine block the NMDA receptor. Now, if we look at that slide, I want you to look at the VL glut, little red circle. And what happens in a synapse is when a signal comes in, a nerve signal, you begin to load up the synapse and glutamate comes out. And when glutamate comes out, this transporter, the EAAT2, is one way of eliminating glutamate and keeping just the right amount around. It also can activate presynaptic receptors. That would be the metatropic receptors. There's an example. So that when it comes out, it activates the NMDA, it activates the AMPA, and if there's too much of it, the NMDA uh, actually can cause problems. It can cause synapses to decrease. If everything goes right, you have more of them. If you have too much activity here, you start to lose them. And if you lose them, that would correspond to what we found looking at the synapses in our learned helpless animals. So the idea we had is that there's simply too much glutamate in this synapse. And if we can get rid of it, maybe that's a way of approaching depression. Too much glutamate also causes another problem which is very serious in depression, and that's inflammation. So inflammation, which we're not going to talk about very much today, also occurs in the brain when people get depressed. Now, I want to focus in a minute on this EAAT1 glutamate uptake system. This is the system that removes glutamate, and interestingly enough, it removes it not into the neuron, 
but it removes it into astrocytic cells. It's a, it's a transporter that's dear to my heart because we discovered it in 1970 in my lab. Now, uh, all of this, when it's working right, leads to neuroplasticity, learning, and memory. When it's working wrong, the system is messed up. If we go to the next slide, let's look at glutamate transporter activity in our two lines of animals. And what we see, and especially note the frontal cortex, FC, what we see is that the astrocytic glutamate transporter is decreased by more than 50% in the frontal cortex. That's the area that we think is so important in reading depression. So if we have knocked out this transporter, we're going to damage the whole circuit. And this transporter might be a way of restoring function if we could restore it. So we began to look for compounds that might restore the transporter. In the next slide, you'll see some evidence from humans. We looked in our animals at the glutamate to GABA ratios, and we showed that they were elevated. That is, there's too much glutamate floating around in the brains of our health animals. How does it look in people? The second paper referenced was done by a group headed by Georg Nortov in Ottawa. And this is a very good imaging group. And what they did was they looked at severely depressed patients and they did spectroscopy. And they came up with the model shown on the next slide in their paper, which basically says that too much glutamate comes out and is exo, uh, excitotoxic. And the reason it's excitotoxic is not enough is taken up into the glial cells, that there are too few transporters in the glial cells, and the glutamate stays in the synaptic cleft, causing toxicity. So that if you could get more transporter and get rid of this glutamate, it might be a way of effectively treating depression. So we began to look through the literature what compounds would induce the synthesis of the glutamate transporter. And what we found was that there were some compounds that would do this. And some of those compounds also appeared to decrease inflammation. So this would be ideal. The group we found were drugs that are potassium ATPase inhibitors. And these drugs appear to be able to induce the astrocytic glutamate transporter, which would get rid of this toxic glutamate and would allow normal function in the brain. One of these drugs uh, called diazoxide uh, is on the market. It's currently hardly used. It's used to treat insulomas of all things in pediatrics. But because it's on the market and FDA approved, it's a very old drug. It was introduced as an antihypertensive, but it wasn't that effective. It has passed all of the toxicity requirements. It's not the best drug in this class for doing what we want to do, the drug that we can test on people now. So that at the moment, we actually have a trial going on at the NIMH with Carlos Cerati, looking at diazoxide as a potential antidepressant. The problems we're finding is that it may not uh, get into the brain well enough and it may cause some side effects at high doses and, and perhaps not be effective. But looking at this class, we may be able to find a drug that is better suited. In the next slide, you'll see how it works on animals, but this was at very high doses. So it actually reverses the genetically helpless animals, which nothing but deep brain stimulation reversed prior. But these were very high doses of diazoxide. 
and it might not be possible to use these kinds of doses in people. So this suggests to us that there's really a possibility for a new route to synthesize um, new antidepressants that may be more effective than our current drugs. In summary, in the last slide, you'll see that there are multiple routes that alter behavior, and they include all of the things we've talked about in the past about depression, norepinephrine, serotonin, corticotropin releasing factor. Our postulate is that astrocytic loss of function may play a role in, in depression, and it involves decreases in glutamate uptake. And we feel that overactive glutamate contributes to activating the lateral habenula, which becomes the major locus of control uh, in the brain for mood. And we suggest that there are probably many etiologies and defects, but that this habenular pathway may be the common final pathway. So our hope is to find drugs which we can use to modify this pathway and uh, end up with more effective antidepressant compounds. Thanks for your attention, and thanks to the following people. Uh, working at Brookhaven National Lab with me were Martine Marion and Dan Daniela Schultz. Matthias Sink did the uh, glutamate transporter assays. Uh, at the Central Institute in Germany. I was the chair there for a decade. Barbara Vollmeyer and Alex Sartorius did the animal studies and uh, the deep brain stimulation. This picture is a picture of Cold Spring Harbor Lab. That little yacht club looking building is the building where our final studies were done and they were done in co cooperation with Bo Lee and Robert Malino, who's now at the University of California at San Diego. And the PTS, uh, the synapse studies were done by a group at University of California and Irvine in, co in combination with us, which included Gary Lynch, Ron Cease, and Biff Bunny. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope uh, we've stimulated your thinking about depression. Um, I, I, I am confident that, that this presentation did do that. Um, Fritz, and I just want to say thank you so much, not only for your presentation, but for your extraordinary work. And I think as you described it, um, although some of the details may be a little bit complicated, people may not have followed every single thing, I think one of the key take-home points is that you showed the process by which very basic information from basic research can then be translated to potentially clinical treatment that can make a big difference for people. And they, we, we received a number of questions about people who are interested in, in this. One of them, just a very basic question for some of the people who may not know what deep brain stimulation is. Could you say a few sentences just about what the process of deep brain stimulation, what the surgery is, et cetera? OK. Deep brain stimulation really was first used in Parkinson's disease. And what happens is um, you find an area of the brain that you think is overactive or malfunctioning. And, you, and it's a very specific area. If you have such a specific area, the idea is to neurosurgically implant an electrode and change the function of that area. In our case, what we're trying to do is neurosurgically implant the electrode right at the edge of the lateral habenula and inhibit that structure. Helen Mayberg, who I think has given one of these presentations a while ago, is very involved in deep brain stimulation, and she uses another area, which is in the medial prefrontal cortex. The problem with these studies is that location is inordinately specific, and all cases may not be the same so that large-scale trials have not been positive, although individual cases, like I showed you one, have been unbelievably successful. And so you have the problem of trying to figure out criteria to pick 
those patients who will respond, because you certainly don't want to put patients through this if they're not going to benefit. Uh, excellent explanation. Um, sometimes people think of it almost like having a similar to a pacemaker um, instead of for a heart, a, a similar kind of procedure as a pacemaker is, but for the brain. Um, and that it really can have a tremendous effect for people in Parkinson's and, uh, and certainly in some people for depression. The, um, a couple of questions from people who uh, are in that percentage of uh, individuals who don't respond to current treatment. And one of the, uh, one, one of the lines of questioning uh, relates to are there any um, ways to tell who might respond to these types of treatments? Are there any biomarkers? Are there any clinical types of indications that would help us differentiate those who would respond versus those who may not? We're working on that right now, and I don't think we have perfect ones. And people are concerned about that as well for the ketamine trials. Um, at the moment, uh, it's it's still very, very tricky to say who is going to respond and who isn't. Um, we are thinking there ought to be some imaging uh, approaches that would allow us to do this. The problem is the kind of thing I showed you with the tryptophan depletion only works on patients who already respond to the SSRIs. So that test isn't going to be very useful. But that kind of an idea is, is what we're all thinking about and trying to develop other probes that might, in an imaging way, give us a picture of those people who will respond as opposed to those who don't. But at the moment, we don't have that. Okay. Um, one of the, the things that um, I'm curious about uh, relates to the fact that in various forms of treatment for depression there's overlap with effectiveness for other conditions and I'm curious if you have any information yet or any thoughts about the role of the habinula in other conditions whether it be anxiety, post-traumatic stress, etc and the role of, of, of that specific area of the brain for those conditions as well? Yeah, the, the uh, last webinar you had, I think, before this one was on addiction. And I think my, my colleague, Nora Volkow, probably talked about dopamine. I didn't hear it, but I know Nora's talk. Mm -hmm. And yes. I'm sure she talked about dopamine. And interestingly enough, uh, the habenula is, is a very, Nora and I have talked about this, a very interesting target because it can turn off uh, the dopamine system or turn it on, as Hikasaka showed, depending on, on whether there's a perceived reward or a perceived punishment. And so this could be an area, again, where um, altering habenular function changes the vulnerability to addiction and that's something that people are looking at at the moment. Okay. So whether that's for going to be useful in PTSD isn't, isn't clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, but for the more attention is going from you know more uh, different approaches in terms of what the habinula may actually have an effect. They do, on. yeah. 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 It yeah. seems like this very teeny little control center. And, and for example, um, in depression, we know that circadian rhythms are, are messed up. And surprisingly, this teeny little center is a secondary uh, circadian clock. So it, it does an enormous number of things, considering how small it is. Right. The, um, it, it, as we learn more, obviously, there'll be uh, further uh, information. Um, and, and in fact, just as we're speaking now, a question has come up about the role of the habinula in sleep disorders. Is, is there anything that you can say further about that? Not much, although 
Um, Biff Bunny and I have talked about it quite a bit because Biff is very interested in sleep as a potential mechanism in depression, and it may very well play a role in insomnia and sleep disorders. Uh, but that hasn't been elucidated yet. It, there's still a great deal to be done in trying to understand this structure. And um, any information yet on bipolar disorder, and in particular when depression occurs in the context of bipolar disorder? Not specifically. Um, and that, I think, is something we could get at with modern-day imaging. And I think that's something that we should think about looking at, but it, it hasn't been done. Okay. So people are listening to this webinar and are hearing um, new, new areas, new avenues of research that can have a tremendous effect moving forward. Similarly, um, how about the issue of suicidality? Um, we know from some of the research on ketamine that the, the effects that it has aren't just on depressive symptoms, but also on acute suicidality. And ha do you have information yet in terms of that issue and the habinula? The only thing we have so far is that Suicidal patients who responded to the deep stim brain stimulation of the habenula, and there's only been two, uh, lost their suicidal ideation completely as they responded. The role of the habenula in initiating suicidal ideation is completely unclear. It probably is an intermediary in the pathway, so if you, if you stop the pathway, then, then you stop the suicidal ideation. And the response to, in, in the few people that responded to the deep brain stimulation in, in the habinula was, as you described, once the right dosage, so to speak, of, um, of, of the well, stimulation occurred, <laughs> of electricity, yeah. right. Um, once that, that amount was reached, it was an immediate effect for the individual? Yes, it's very, it's very quick. And very quick. once the stimulator is turned off, the uh, reoccurrence of symptoms are, are within a matter of half a day. For people, again, and I think you really very eloquently spoke about the different percentages of people who respond and don't respond, and the fact that there are currently, a, well, the majority of people do respond. There are currently a million people who aren't responding to treatment. What should those people do right now? What should they do today? Well, right now, I think they need, they need support, and they need uh, to be involved with a therapist and, uh, hopefully, a psychopharmacologist. Some of them will probably be people who have not tried uh, ketamine who might respond to it and I think they should get themselves to tertiary centers and see if there are experimental treatments that are available for them but most importantly is I think they should be working with a therapist and getting as much support as possible because it's very difficult to live with the constant uh, anxiety and, and low self-esteem that depression causes. So they should they shouldn't give up. They should continue with, they should with treatment. Keep, they should keep going. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. and 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 one area to pursue might be in an academic setting where there are research protocols going on that might offer them something different than what they've had before. Right. Right. The um and I think that the type of work that you're doing certainly offers hope um, for significant um, changes. We, we've heard over the years in um, medication the, the phrase Me Too drugs, which are basically medicines that act in the same fashion. The work that you're doing and that others are doing really ought to develop a new type of medicine that's not a Me Too drug that really can have an impact. What 
what do you see as a timeline for um, the work that you're doing now to ultimately bring a medicine to market that really can help um, so many people? I would hope that between two to four years we should we should have something if we can get positive results. And I'm I must uh, commend the NIMH for its willingness to try these things at the uh, clinical center in Bethesda. Uh, that's made it a lot easier to to begin this testing and to try to move forward. Um, and do you have other specific medications in mind that you're looking at um, that you know may be on the market or may not yet be on the market but are potential um, we have a few you ideas but we have a few ideas for different uh, kinds of compounds other than what we're looking at at the moment but in these cases uh, they're really new and the problem there to go forward is the enormous cost of doing the toxicology on people. And it, it would really require uh, getting the medicine to look hopeful enough in preclinical studies to interest a drug company because individuals just can't move forward into early clinical testing and toxicology studies. It's too expensive. Um, we have a number of questions um, asking about is there any link between the issue of the glutamate and diet? Are there things that people can do with regards to that to potentially have an effect with regards to the depression? Well, it's not clear that you can increase um, the results by lowering glutamate because glutamate is so essential to the body. What is interesting is that monosodium sodium glutamate, which is in a very common additive, for example, in Chinese food, is actually toxic. It can, at high doses, kill cells in the brain, and that was work done years ago by John Olney, and I think it's held up so that you don't want to have too much of it. Uh, I think as a as a caution, uh, I would say if you've got a treatment resistant depression, stay away from monosodium glutamate containing foods. That that's good guidance for people to uh, take, even if it's, even if it's based on some evidence but not clear cut evidence. Better to you know follow that that suggestion, and uh, above and beyond supportive therapy, psychotherapy, et cetera, um, any role of exercise in what we've been discussing? Well, exercise stimulates endorphins and it always helps. I uh, have always advocated that my patients exercise. Uh, it's sometimes very hard to get depressed people to do that, but I think it's always useful if you can do that. <laughs> good, good, helpful guidance again. Um, what do you see when we, uh, we're probably going to ask you in, in two years from now to come back and, and do a follow-up webinar. If you're looking into your crystal ball, what do you see, what are you going to tell us then so that we sort of have the coming attractions? What do you see that you'll be able to report to us in two years or four years from now? Well, I hope. Of course, I'm getting to an age where I may not be functioning four years from now. Um, but I hope that we will have clear-cut criteria for the DBS and can say this will work for you or it won't. And I hope that we will have a series of new medications completely different from the SSRIs uh, or the monoamine oxidase drugs that will act on the glutamatergic system and the gaminergic system trying to restore the balance in those systems. Uh, I think that's a good chance in four to five years. Well, that's very exciting, and um, we we all uh, need you to continue to be doing your work in the next two to five years. So we're not taking any excuses whatsoever. So you need to <laughs> be healthy and continue doing that. Um, and I, I want to thank you, Fritz, for all the work that you do 
for this presentation. And again, I, I want to emphasize how your work really shows the importance of the basic science, different aspects of it, whether it be the, down to the uh, neurochemicals um, and the cellular level um, to making use of um, MRIs and, and other uh, visual effects to, um, to clinical trials. Um, and also, you mentioned a large number of collaborators that you've worked with and that really science is a team effort um, and you've been an extraordinary leader of teams to, to bring this forward. So thank you very much for all that you've been doing. I, I also well, want to you thank you for the funding. You know, it's, that is what we're here for and that is why that's, we're so fortunate to have, yeah. uh, yes, it, and we, we are fortunate to have um, such uh, extraordinarily generous at all levels, uh, extraordinarily generous donors. Um, and along those lines, you, you, you fed me into my next sentence perfectly, so thank you. Um, as people are aware, all of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, large or small, please visit bbrfoundation.org or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded, so if you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with a family member or friend, visit the webinar page on our website. And I hope that you'll join us again next month when Dr. Carrie Bearden, professor at the University of California in Los Angeles, will present a webinar entitled The Adolescent Brain and Mood Disorder Risk. This will take place on Tuesday, October 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, once again, thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care.